Yes. But I will thank you for an awesome time. We thank you for the time in your presence. We thank you for the word of righteousness. We thank you for the word in Jeremiah 3 15. So you shall send us pastors after your heart. We thank you for this word that we learn. It will establish us in all truth and in all righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. I cannot hear anything. Um, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for uh, praying. Thank you. OK, let's get started. Um, so we have now uh, completed most of John chapter 13. There was this last portion that we were unable to finished last class. Uh, so we will just quickly look into that. And then uh, hopefully we will be able to do John chapter 14 as well as 15 today. Uh, that's the goal. Um, so we will begin with John chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. Uh, so if we could have someone read out for us, please. John 13, verses 31 and 32. John 13, verse 31 and 32 says, So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and the God and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Amen. Yes. So here it says that uh, because the Son is glorifying the Father, the Father will also glorify the Son. And um, um, we see, uh, in, in, if you were to look in your textbook, it calls it the reciprocity of glorification. Um, as in, uh, when uh, the Lord is glorified, when the Father is glorified, He glories the one who is you know, glorifying Him um, in that sense. So uh, because Jesus is glorifying the Father, the Father also will glorify him. And uh, so in an, uh, to an extent, that seems to apply even to the church. Um, uh, because I remember the other day when uh, we had, uh, I think it was um, uh, Brother Albuquerque, you know, he's, he asked, um, do believers also share in God's glory? Uh, are they also glorified, you know, even as Jesus was? And um, uh, for those of us who are in the Google Classroom, I had posted uh, some of the Bible verses in the uh, stream page. And I'm not sure whether you know you got a chance to see that or not. Uh, but then I'll just kind of mention that once again. Because um, uh, what we see over here in this verse, uh, we see um, Paul echoing something very similar uh, in, in another scripture with regard to believers. Uh, so we'll very briefly look into that. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be useful even for the e-platform students, you know, who don't get to see the stream page. Um, right. Um, yeah. So uh, Second um, Thessalonians chapter one, verses eleven and twelve. If someone could read out, because that is where you have similar wording to what we have over here. Second Thessalonians one, eleven and twelve. Second Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12 says, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so here in John, we have the wording, John 13, 32. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself. 
And here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12, we have similar wording. Uh, the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. Okay, so um, um, when we glorify the Lord Jesus, in the same way the Lord Jesus glorified the Father, uh, Jesus will glorify us in himself. In the same way, the Father glorified Jesus in Himself. Okay, so in uh, in that order, in that sense, uh, so there is a sense in which believers also participate in the glory of God. Uh, we too are glorified in Him. Uh, so uh, in the stream page, uh, I had put up some verses regarding this. Uh, the most common uh, uh, way in which this term "glorified" is used with regard to believers. Um, it's not in the typical sense that we would think of glory because we think of it more in terms of reward and in being honored. Uh, but, um, you know, it's more like a uh, glorification of our status, of our position in Christ. Uh, so many of the verses, in fact, refer to that where they talk about how believers have been glorified in the sense that um, they have been confirmed into the image of the Son of God. Um, so that would be Romans chapter, you know, this I'm just reading out these verses for those who are who don't have access to the stream page. So verses which talk about how we are glorified in the sense that we are confirmed to the image of his son. The verses would be Romans chapter 8, verse 17, also verses 29 to 30, John 17, 22, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Uh, those are just some of the verses. Uh, the second way in which we talk about glorification is the reward which we would receive from the Lord. Uh, so some verses which talk about that, Romans 2.10, 2 Thessalonians 1.12, 2 Timothy 2.10 and 12. Uh, then coming to the third uh, way in which we tend to think of the word glorification, uh, it's more like uh, not really a reward, a material reward or, or anything of that sort, but just an uh, God honoring and saying, you know, um, um, that I'm pleased with my servant or, or, or something along those lines where God honors us. Uh, so that would be uh, John 12, 26, uh, 1 Samuel 2, 30, 1 Chronicles 29, 12, uh, where it talks about uh, God honoring a person. Uh, so uh, these are some ways in which we too share in the glory of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so there is always a reciprocity of glorification. Um, the Lord deserves all glory and he is glorified. Uh, there is really no need for him at all to share his glory with us. But we see there are scriptures which talk about how we too get to share uh, because uh, Jesus is considered the, uh, you know, the first fruits, the son. And um, in that sense, once in him, through him, we also become sons and daughters. We also become part of the family. So in the same way, God has shared his glory with us. Son, uh, he shares that glory even with all of us because we too are regarded as uh, family. Yeah. Mm. Moving on from there to the next verse, uh, if someone could read out for us verse 33, because uh, for the disciples who would have heard those words for the first time, uh, it would have been highly shocking. Uh, verse 33. Yes. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, Amen. Yeah. So um, the disciples had given up everything uh, to follow the Lord. They had literally been traveling with him from village to village, town to town, um, you know, um, just earning whatever livelihood they can on the side. Uh, so uh, they have lived that way because they truly believe that this is the Messiah. And just like everyone else, they were still kind of under the impression that this would be a kind of uh, 
political uh, you know messiahship uh, where he would be delivering them and so they probably imagined that they would now uh, occupy high positions uh, you know once the, uh, jesus comes into power uh, they being his closest inner circle uh, they would be occupying positions of uh, you know power in the garment and all of that so now he says to them i will be with you only a little longer and where i am going you cannot come uh, that would have been quite a shocking statement they would have wondered is he leaving us is he abandoning us and so immediately you know uh, jesus goes on uh, to assure them that that is not the case um, uh, so he does you know talk about this in greater detail all the way into john chapter 14 now uh, where he explains what he means by you know that he is not going to be there uh, for a while uh, because he promises them that he will come back to them he promises that in uh, chapter 14 uh, so uh, before he gets into all of that uh, this is the command that jesus gives uh, we see that in verses 34 and 35 uh, if uh, someone could read out for us verses 34 and 35 A new, commandment um, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love, if you have love for one another. Amen. Amen. So here it says, a new command I give you. And... Uh, that does not make much sense because this is a command that was given um, you know in the old testament itself where we are expected to show love to our neighbor um, but over here the greek word that is used um, is talking about uh, something that is fresh something that is always fresh um, as in the opposite of something that is you know now old and worn out and no longer valid so um, this command on the other hand never wears out never becomes invalid it is always uh, ever fresh and always very very relevant and pertinent for all of us so in that sense it's a new command so jesus is saying i am giving you the ever fresh command you know a reminder of a command that has always been pertinent that will always be relevant for you something to for you to always observe just as i have loved you so you must love one another and he goes on to say this is how people will know that you are my disciples only if you show this kind of um of of love so um it's a very um high uh you know command a very high demand that is being placed on us uh because we can do a lot of things to show that we are christ followers uh, you know, we may move in the gifts and be able to perform miracles. Uh, we may be um, very good at uh, sharing things from the word of God. Uh, but then if we are not showing love, uh, that is the main uh, uh, mark of a follower of Christ. And if we are unable to show that and uh, people can see bitterness in our lives and uh, they can uh, see that we are holding grudges and all of that, uh, then really that mark of discipleship is not seen. So uh, more than anything else, the thing which sets us apart as his disciples is love. And uh, so it becomes very important for us to see whether we are very careful uh, to bear this particular mark. Uh, are we walking in love towards one another? That becomes a very important um, a commandment. Now, another thing which I you know uh, like about these verses, uh, um, here Jesus says, you know, I'm again repeating to you this ever fresh commandment that's always been there. Uh, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And we automatically connect this verse to the cross. We think, yes, even as Jesus loved on the cross, being willing to give up his life, we too should be willing to lay down our lives for one another. But you see, when he, when Jesus first spoke those words to his disciples, uh, the cross had not yet happened. Um, the disciples had not yet become aware of such a thing as a cross, which would, you know, um, uh, happen. So when he said those words, "As I have loved you, so you must love one another," I wonder what thoughts came to the disciples' minds. You know, they would have looked back over the previous three years they would have remembered you know recollected memories of different 
um, um, events, experiences when when they experienced his love in different ways. Maybe an act of kindness when they were tired, you know, uh, when they when they messed up in some way, a word of encouragement or a, or a loving word of correction. They would have recollected all those instances of how he loved them, how he was over generous and kind and um, you know merciful, uh, showing them grace when they didn't deserve grace. They would have been reminded of so many instances of how he loved them, and so now he is saying, "As I have loved you, you know, over these three years, so you must love one another." So um, uh, we tend to link this verse only to one experience, uh, the experience of the cross, but there's more to it. Uh, love is expressed in a hundred different ways. And Jesus would have demonstrated all of those ways to his disciples. What a privileged bunch of people they were, you know. I mean, um, worldly-wise, they didn't have anything much. They were like wanderers moving from village to village with Jesus. Uh, but uh, when it came to being with him, interacting with him, uh, how rich they were because they would have experienced his love in a billion different ways. And so now he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Yeah, um, and then uh, we move into the uh, passage where you know Jesus says that uh, Peter would deny him. Um, those would be verses thirty-six to thirty-eight. If uh, someone could read out for us, please, verses thirty-six to thirty-eight. Yeah, Jesus said to him, "Lord, where are you going?" Jesus answered him, "Where?" I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you'll follow after. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Yes. Uh, so um, at this point, uh, you know, Peter, he says, I can follow you. I mean, I don't know which place you're talking about, how, uh, and maybe you're saying that you'll go over there alone because, you know, it's risky or dangerous, but I can come with you because I'm willing to even die for you. And uh, so Peter, we, we see uh, throughout uh, his personality type being the very um, effusive, very expressive type. Uh, you know, he, he demonstrates his, uh, his, uh, thoughts, his feelings out loud in his words and his actions. That's just how he is. That's just his personality type. And so here, most effusively, he says, I'm willing to die for you. So wherever you're going, I can follow you. I can come with you. And uh, Jesus says, you know, you're going to be denying me three times. And uh, uh, so Peter uh, here is speaking when uh, he, his emotions are at a height, uh, when, his, when he's filled with uh, love and devotion and then a day came uh, when those emotions were at their lowest ebb you know and at that point of time he couldn't work up the emotions to be able to you know stand take a stand for Jesus so um, one simple thing that we can learn from this is that emotions sometimes uh, reach a high sometimes emotions kind of you know um, ebb and go down uh, but the commitment that we make, uh, would have to be a commitment that we make in our mind and heart. Uh, it can't just be restricted to emotions because emotions come and go. You all have must have noticed on the days when we are like extra tired and you know, and uh, we are you know sleepy and uh, not feeling too well. Uh, at such times, we don't feel very em enthusiastic about the things of God. So we don't usually base uh, our Christian walk on emotions. Uh, whether we are feeling bright and uh, active and uh, full of energy, or whether we're feeling really tired and low, we tend to you know, uh, place our walk with the Lord on the commitment that we have made. We have decided that we're going to walk with him, that we're going to serve him, that we are going to live right. And so whether the feelings are there or not, whether the emotions are uh, positive or negative, we just choose you know, to go ahead and um, express our commitment, which is what Jesus also did in the Garden of Gethsemane. At that point, his emotions were not very high. Uh, he wasn't feeling very positive and uh, uh, happy about what was coming up. So he did not base uh, his decision on his emotions. 
he based it on the commitment which he had already finished making a long time ago so we follow his example we do not follow our emotions because like peter we will have days when we are feeling high and very very passionate for the lord and there'll be days when uh, we are so sick or weak or tired that we are the emotions are nowhere around but we continue because we have made a commitment and we base all our decisions on that commitment rather than feelings which come and go uh, yeah uh, so uh, with that maybe we can actually quickly move into john chapter 14 um where jesus says some very nice things uh, he's beginning beginning now to prepare his disciples uh, because these are his these are like his final last words to them uh, so he's going to be talking about many many things which he regards that are the top of the list you know the most important things which he must convey to them uh, before the crucifixion so uh, almost everything that he says um, you know 14th chapter onwards um, we would need to really pay attention to because um, these are the things that he wants to convey to his disciples his followers including us you know including us so um, these are all important things so he has just told them that they cannot follow him where he is going, uh, but he assures them that he is going to come back. And so this is what Jesus says uh, in verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so John chapter 14, if someone could read out the first three verses. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Yeah, so um, he has told them, you cannot follow me where I am going. And now in verse 3, he says, uh, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So he's saying, you know, I mean, there's a bond which has developed between, you know, in, 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 between these people in this little group, uh, Jesus and his disciples. They've shared so much together, you know tears and pain and uh, struggles and victories and triumphs and joys and all of that is a deep bond between them and now he's saying he's going to go away and they cannot follow him where he's going so he's saying you know don't worry i will come back and i will take you to be with me okay so whatever he is saying in these verses need to be taken in that sense uh, because i mean we who have uh, who are now living like thousands of years later uh, we tend to kind of very dryly analyze and you know dissect this passage and uh, we kind of tend to lose out on the essence of what is contained over here in this passage where these people are feeling kind of sad that the one that they love is going to he says he's going to go away but they want to be with him they want to be near him they want to continue uh, you know talking to him interacting with him and so he says don't worry i'll come back i'll take you and you will get to be with me and you'll always be with me and so in that context he says um, he uses this imagery over here he says in verse 2 my father's house has many rooms if that were not so would i have told you that i'm going there to play prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come back and take you to be with me and uh, this is something that they would have very easily understood the imagery used over here uh, because that is basically how um, you know their homes functioned um, I mean, now in our modern times, um, due to financial reasons and I don't know, a whole bunch of other reasons probably, um, we, you know, have nuclear family units, uh, people move away, you know, you just have husband, wife and kids living separately in one house. But that is not how they lived, you know, especially um, uh, in that region, you know, and also in our Asian um, um, regions also. Uh, in fact, in many, many places, we still have a joint family set up, right? So you have uh, uh, entire brothers, sisters, their wives, their children, all living under, you know, one uh, huge roof. If not one roof, at least, you know, together in one single compound and things like that. So uh, this is the kind of setup that uh, Jesus is talking about over here. And they would have understood that because all their homes would have been that kind of you know, joint family setups. So uh, when a son in the family would get married 
they would just build an extra set of rooms for him and his wife you know and for the children that they're going to have so uh, so basically your house would continue growing in size uh, as each son gets married and you know brings in his uh, bride uh, you would have extra rooms added so uh, it would be like a, a large setup and if no if they can't make an extension to the actual original house you know they would have it somewhere nearby i know so in that way you would have all these joint family setups and uh, so um this kind of um, western idea of um, you know each son going off separately and building one mansion for himself and living separately away from the rest of the family is would have been a kind of foreign idea for these people you know living in this particular culture so um, the imagery over here is talking about how you are uh, you know i am going to go to the father uh, because that's you know jesus is saying i am going to go to the father because i am his son but you two are all going to be sons you you two are going to be part of my family so don't worry when i go over there i'll prepare rooms for you you know i'll build all these extensions so that you can come over there and be under my father's roof in in his own home not in some separate place you know in a in a different house but you will be with me in my home under my father's roof okay so that's the uh, that's the grandeur of what is being expressed over here um now i'm not Uh, trying to shatter anyone's dream of having a wonderful mansion in heaven um, so i mean i don't know over here whether jesus is talking uh, literally uh, physically where you're really going to have one one large house set up with all extensions or whether really you're going to have separate separate mansions i do not know but the essence of what is being conveyed over here is that you are going to be part of my family under my roof the father's roof itself not just some separate house out there like as if your step children you know but rather sons and daughters of the same family part of one single unit you know so that is the beauty of what is being conveyed over here uh, so um, i do not know whether it literally physically talks about rooms and extensions which will be added on or there would be separate separate mansions um, all that's uh, not really very relevant what is very important is that this oikos you know this house that he is talking about my father's house my father's oikos that greek word oikos which means house home um, he is talking about how we will be literally part of that home uh, not some separate place like as if you are a step child or not really a fully recognized child okay so um the this a deep closeness uh, um family uh, imagery that is being used over here all right let's look at uh, verses 4 5 and 6 if someone could read out for us and you Where know what you know and the way you know thomas said to him Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." So, um, this is a valid question. We know which they raise. We say, "Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we come over there?" Um, so jesus says it is basically through me because all access to the father will be through me and so then he uses this you know very famous uh, which the, the phrase which has become very famous now i am the way the truth and the life so the way is the way to the father has to be through the son there are no alternate ways to god um no other forms of religion uh, can lead to the father not even the christian religion religion on its own can lead to the father it's only through a personal relationship and commitment with jesus that you can go to the father so even uh, even the christian religion on its own is not sufficient to take you to the father only through jesus by becoming his sheep by letting him be your shepherd and your master only in that way can you um, gain access to the father so he says i am the way and he says i am the truth because 
Jesus' words and all his actions. They were trying to reveal who the father is, how he is, what his nature and character is. So um, by watching Jesus' actions, by listening to his words, uh, people would know what the father is like and they would have access to him. And of course, Jesus also says, I am the life because we can only have eternal life in and through him. Uh, without him, uh, we would continue to exist in hell. But that would no that, not, that would not be called life at all. Uh, so eternal life is possible only in and through Jesus Christ. And so he says, through me you will have access to the Father. Um, verses twelve to fourteen. If someone could read out. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever you believes in me will also do the work that I do, and greater work than this will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Yes, a uh, lot of debate regarding these verses. How can anyone possibly do greater works than Jesus? So what on earth does do that term greater mean? Does it mean that, um, that did it just mean that we would do a larger number of um, you know, miracles than him because he was one individual when he was moving around on the earth? So he could only do a limited number of miracles, whereas we are a large group of uh, you know billions of believers. So maybe we can uh, together um, perform more miracles. So is it greater miracles in that sense, greater things than Jesus did in that sense? Or does it mean more um, um, powerful, involving greater, grandeur? Does it mean those kind of things that we would do? Uh, so no one really knows what exactly the term means. Um, but whether it is regarding just the number of things that we would do, or whether it's the higher quality or greater grandeur of what we would do, um, Jesus doesn't seem to be too concerned about that. He just simply says, um, you know, I, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So he says, um, you will be doing greater things. And when you pray to me and ask me in my name, I will uh, help you accomplish those things so that the Father is glorified. So over here, Jesus does not have any kind of inferiority complex. Uh, he is not. Uh, he is not worried that. Um, if we do something which is grander and greater than the things that he did, it would somehow in way make him feel bad. No, because uh, ultimate goal is that the Father should be glorified. So he says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the uh, Son. OK, so um, and in verse 14, you may ask me for um, anything in my name, and I will uh, do it. So um, we should be people uh, who are doing all the things that we do for the glory of the Father, uh, not to promote ourselves, um, not to you know um, somehow gain personally from these acts of ministry that we are doing, but we must be doing all that we do with God's glory in mind. Uh, and sometimes that may mean that we would be training up people who will outshine us. They will do greater things than us. You know, so um, uh, it's just I mean, interesting. I was just uh, speaking to somebody uh, a few weeks ago and you know about how we can hear the voice of God and all of that. And I just shared a few thoughts. I mean, I didn't, I didn't say anything great, uh, but I just kind of got that person going on how to hear from God. And now this person over the last few weeks has been hearing from God in such an amazing way. I have never heard from God in that way. I mean, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Uh, so I think that person just needed that, you know, that little bit of advice and encouragement. And now they're like going great. And so the people that you're training up, the people that you're imparting, what you know, teaching you're imparting to them, they will outshine you. They will go and do a spectacular 
spectacular things which you have never done and it's beautiful because god has his own way of working in different people's lives and the whole point is at the end of it god gets glorified okay so uh, uh, you have no idea what on earth you'll you'll be triggering through your ministry i you know amazing things uh, so you may not be very talented or skilled you may not be you know very uh, powerful in moving in the gifts and all of that but god has given you you know your your share of grace you use that fully use it fully and really train up people uh, you know and god will maybe take them and do amazing things through them and at the end of it all you know his kingdom purposes will be established satan will be crushed and god would be amazingly glorified so that should be our goal in in all that we do uh, you know so that in the end um, god will be glorified so when with that attitude whatever we ask for in the name of jesus it will be granted to us because we are asking in the line uh, of jesus will jesus will is that the father must be glorified in everything so as long as we keep that as our focus uh, and we ask for anything um, and our attitude is right it will be granted to us um what else can we talk about from this uh, yeah you know in my name it says right uh, whatever you ask in my name so we must be very conscious uh, that we are asking in his name so whatever we ask has to be in line with jesus character it has to be in line with what he would desire what he would approve of so uh, we can't just randomly ask for whatever uh, we want um, uh so we would have to ask in line with his will and in in line with his character and nature then he would grant it to us so that the father may be glorified um all right uh, maybe we can look at verses 15 to 18 yeah if someone could read out 15 to 18 please If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will now ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, but because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, you know Him, for He dwells within you and will be in you. I will now leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Yes. Ah, uh, so he he says in verse fifteen, "If you love me." keep my commands so uh, it is good for us to be passionate and full of emotion but then there are days when we will not be feeling anything much but we can continue to show our love by keeping his commandments when the emotions are there when the emotions are not there we are able to continue demonstrating our love by taking all of the right decisions choices so things that will honor him and please him so we express our love chiefly by keeping his commandments whenever emotions are added to that that's excellent i mean that's good but mainly it is the decisions we make the choices we make and the actual uh, uh, the actions that we act out the words that we speak um, the way we are serving all of those things demonstrate our love for the lord mm, and uh, yeah they generally point out verse 16 is the verse where you have all the um, three persons of the trinity being mentioned because you have jesus speaking over there he says i will ask the father so you have jesus and the father being mentioned and uh, uh, he will ask the father to give us the advocate who is the holy spirit the spirit of truth so all the three persons of the holy spirit all the three persons of godhood are mentioned in uh, verse 16 and uh, yeah we would have you know probably listened to a lot of sermons about um this uh, spirit of truth um the word advocate yeah which is used in verse 16 that's the the greek word parakletos and a lot is said about what is the meaning of this word parakletos uh, but basically it just is somebody who comes and stands next to you and is willing to help you so it could be in a different you know in a whole bunch of different ways he could be over there as your advisor or you know as your helper in helping you to complete something because you don't have the strength to do it and he will help you to and aid you in doing it or he could be standing over there as your guide uh, you know giving you advice on uh, what needs to be done um, so it can be taken in taken in a whole uh, 
bunch of senses. Um, he could be over there standing next to you to intercede on your behalf, to mediate on your behalf. So um, it just basically means someone who is now coming and standing alongside you, standing next to you to help you. Uh, so we have the Holy Spirit doing that for us so that in him, through him, through the, through the help and power of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to glorify God in all that we do. Okay, so um, so therefore he says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. He will come to, he says to his disciples that he will come to them in the form of the Holy Spirit. So the um, so the Lord will still continue to be with them, only thing he would not be with them physically. Um, maybe we should uh, move a little faster. Let's see. Uh, Maybe we can look at verse uh, 23, 24. Well, yeah, if someone could read out verses 23 and 24, please. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who yes. does not love me, does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Okay, so over here, Jesus is saying these words that I have been, uh, you know, speaking to you, these teachings that I'm asking you to follow, they are not just from me, they belong to the Father who sent me. So if we respect these teachings, if we keep them, if we honor the, his word, it shows that we are honoring the Father. Uh, so if we have that attitude of obedience towards the word of God, then it says, uh, the Father and Jesus will come to us and make our home with us. Uh, you know, um, in the Old Testament times, uh, how did God make his home, his dwelling place among the people? It was through the tabernacle and then through the temple. Uh, so God wanted to dwell among his people, but there were restrictions um, because of his great holiness. Uh, if he had just simply come down into the land of Israel, they all would have just dropped down dead uh, because you know of their sinful condition. So he had to restrict himself uh, to one tiny little room in the Holy of Holies. So he would allow his glory to be restricted to that one tiny little, little room. And in that restricted manner, he chose to dwell among his people. Uh, but now those restrictions are removed uh, because now he is he can come down literally into our lives and be part of us. You know, so it says we will come to them and make our home with them. And it's an amazing thing. So which means, you know, um, we have the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit living in us. We have um, all of God, uh, you know, part and parcel of our lives. So uh, if the Israelites would go to the temple and stand over there in front of the Holy of Holies, you know, uh, not even inside the building, outside the building, they would stand outside and bow down in reverence. How much more careful should we be in our own lives? Because we literally have them making their home in us. So uh, we need to take this very, very seriously that we are the habitation of God. We are the temple of God. God literally is living in us. He has come to make his home with us. So how would we show that we are honoring him? It is mainly by honoring his word. How seriously do we take it? To what extent do we believe it? Do we really believe what he is promising in his word? Or are we having doubts and saying, no, 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 I'm sure God is just exaggerating over here. I'm sure he doesn't really mean these things that he's saying. Will he really deliver to that extent? Will he really bless and help to that extent? So is it uh, doubt that we are having? that if we have doubt in our hearts, that's not really honoring his word. Again, obedience. Um, if we are not really doing what he's telling us to do, then again, that would not really be honoring his word. So over here, Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And uh, in verse 24, he says, they are not just obeying my teaching. It is something that has come to me from the Father 
so anyone who has that attitude of reverence towards my word my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them okay this is a very grand promise that is being given to the uh, believers uh, yeah uh, we have another few minutes uh, maybe yeah we could maybe if, if someone could read out verses 25 26 27 These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave it to you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Okay, so over here we have uh, um, Jesus saying that when the advocate, the whole, the Paracletos, when he is sent, uh, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So, in the same way, the uh, Jesus Christ was a very um, faithful representative of the Father. He conveyed only what the Father wanted conveyed. He only taught the words which the Father gave him to teach. He was very, very careful in how he represented the Father. In the same way, the Holy Spirit who has now come to us, he represents Jesus most carefully. He doesn't change any of the words of Jesus. He does not say anything which is contrary to what Jesus ha has actually taught. So whatever he teaches, whatever he explains and expands to us from the word of God, it is all in line with, the, with what Jesus had originally you know, conveyed through his word. Uh, so in the same way, Jesus faithfully represented the Father. The Holy Spirit now is very faithfully representing Jesus Christ and his message to us. Um, and then uh, Jesus concludes with the words over here saying that, uh, peace I leave with you. And he says, I do not give it to you as the world gives because um, the peace which the world talks about is based on outward um, circumstances and situations. When things are going well, uh, when uh, there is no strife or conflict, that is when the world would ca call it a time of peace. Uh, but believers are told, Jesus says, you know, as long as you're in this world, you will always have trials. But Jesus says, do not worry because I am with you. You know, so uh, the peace which Jesus is talking about over here is that uh, even though you will have trials and difficulties, I will be with you. So your peace um, will rest in the fact that I am there to strengthen you, help you, uphold you. And whatever my father's will is, I will see to it that it is all accomplished in your life. So we can have the deep assurance that the Lord is with us in the midst of all our trouble and uh, pain. So it's a greater kind of peace that uh, God is promising over here. So these are just some of the things that we uh, could look at. Um, we will take our break now and we will come back. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, you could maybe we could start off with a few questions after the break and then we'll move into. Um, yeah, we'll look at maybe another one or two things in chapter 14 and then we'll move into uh, chapter 15. All right. So uh, uh, let's get back at uh, 10. Thank you. <laughs> 